name is Wendy Offers and I'm a regional education outreach specialist with uh, Environment and Parks. And um, this evening I'm really excited that John Campbell is joining us again this year uh, to provide us a presentation uh, on uh, Sharp Tail Grouse. Uh, Do you like to dance and discovering the secrets of Sharp Tail Grouse? John grew up um, on a ranch near Millerville and he's been a lifelong conservationist studying a variety of species. Last year, he was the 2015 uh, Order of the Big Horn Award winner for his lifelong work in raptors, particularly the recovery of current falcons and representing the work that his family has done. To my surprise, I also found out that John has done an extensive amount of work observing um, sharp-tailed grouse, and along with his uh, colleague there, Ken Crevin, who's actually a Canadian Geographic uh, Photographic Award winner for actually photos you're going to see here in tonight's presentation on sharp-tailed grouse. They've put together, I think, one of the most amazing presentations I've seen on these wild birds in their native habitat. The photos are stunning. Uh, John, to my surprise also, is a great editor of original video footage, and he's researched the birds in the background of not just the sharp-tailed grouse, but other grouse species that he's going to really inform us about. So uh, I'd like to turn it over to John. And uh, welcome, John, as this evening's speaker. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. And, uh, thank you all for coming. And those of you in uh, other areas, I know, uh, I suspect anyway, in Pincher Creek, you've got a few people. I was down there the weekend before last on Twin Butte. And uh, there were some people at least threatening to come and listen to me talk. So welcome, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who know me and, and uh, know of me, um, I'm mainly a raptor specialist. I know about uh, birds of prey. And uh, not you wouldn't associate grouse with me per se, so why the grouse? And, uh, well, because when I'm out doing my work with birds of prey, there are other species that I find quite interesting. So this being one of them, and a lot of people I've found that don't even know these birds exist, or if they do know that they exist, uh, they don't know what they do. So I did uh, created a video of it because I like to watch them, and I did it just for fun. And I happen to be mentioning to Wendy that uh, I would be uh, I just finishing up a video, and she jumped on it and said, "Good, we'll get you a talk <laughs> again." Um, and then I didn't hear anything for a couple of months or so, and then she called me up and said, so when are we going to put you in for that presentation? And so we decided on that, and that was fine, and then I got to thinking, well, now I'm in trouble because I'm not a biologist, and I'm not a gross expert, so I better make sure I do some homework here and find out what it is that I'm talking about. And mainly I'm concerned about uh, not disseminating uh, incorrect information. So I've put this display together. I've got uh, a video which will be part of it because you really do have to see the birds to uh, understand them. Uh, but also, uh, Wendy mentioned uh, Kenyon here, and uh, Ken took all the sharp tail pictures that you see in this presentation, and he has kindly uh, let me use them. And also, uh, with the next slide, please. Uh, he took this picture, and a little bit of background on this. Uh, it is the Canadian uh, Geographic Picture of the Year. It's a sharp-tailed grouse, so that's part of it. But there's actually a, a closer connection than that. Uh, Ken was with me when uh, we saw this and, and took it. And Ken is also, um, he's very modest, and he'll say, well, I was just lucky. Well, he's been lucky three times in a row to win the contest for uh, Canadian Geographic, and it's out of thousands of pictures. So um, I'll let you decide whether doing it three times in a row is actually luck. But the, the interesting thing about Ken, uh, Ken went to school with my brother Andrew, and uh, so we've known each other for a long time, and he's known the family. But I didn't know that Ken took pictures and uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, we've been uh, in 4-H, our kids were in 4-H together. Uh, we were 4-H leaders, all of this. And then it happened that Ken was interested in uh, grouse and where my video was taken, contacted the guy. 
uh, Larry McKillop's his name, and I had found that uh, lek, as they call it, which is what you call the dancing grounds, and Larry said, well, you'll have to ask John Campbell. So Ken came and said, do you mind? And I said, well, it's really not up to me. It's the birds are the same as everybody else, but sure, we could do that. And then Ken started coming with me when I started doing my raptor work and taking pictures. And for this, how this picture came about, I was saying to, to Ken, I have five different leks or dancing grounds in the area, and I want to check them to see if they're all active and see how many birds are on them. And so he said, do you mind if I come along? And I said, no, sure, go ahead. So we did this, and we were, I think, on our fourth one, and uh, he went and uh, wanted to get some pictures because there was fresh snow on it. And I did go to him somewhat, go with him somewhat to my annoyance. And the reason I didn't go is because we didn't have a blind, and I thought, well, sending two people out is kind of pushing it a bit. And the other reason it was, it was really very cold, and I think Ken froze his butt off, he? but he got some very good pictures. And then we went just down the road a few hundred meters, and it was perfect. We were going north, the sun was in the east, uh, so perfect lighting. This bird was on the west on a, on a snow fence, and so we went on, turned around, Ken said, do you mind if I get some pictures? This would be great. And so. He started out in the truck, and then he opened the door and kind of snuck out and got into the ditch and did that. And anyway, he took, he's got, this is the middle one of three pictures. And I think he's at, we both think he's got better pictures in his collection, but he submitted this and he won it. So I wanted to um, kind of blow uh, Ken's horn a little bit for him because he won't do it, but he's a pretty good photographer. And to thank him for allowing me to use all his pictures uh, in my presentation, all the sharp tail pictures are his. So I wanted to do that. And the only thing that I'm worried about with Ken, and I'll say that is because I do video work, he said to me several times now, you know, my camera does video, but I never thought of doing it. But I think I'll do that. <laughs> and you know what I think? I think I'm in trouble because I think he's going to blow me out of the water if <laughs> I do that. So. Anyway, thank you very much, Ken. Ken is sitting in the audience here, uh, kind of grinning at my, con my, my presentation, but uh, he really does take great pictures, so thanks for that. Uh, now, what am I going to talk about? Um, I'm going to talk about grouse and grouse-like birds to give you a, an overview of sort of what we're talking about, specifically uh, go to sharp tail, and then I'm going to talk about sharp tail ver versus prairie chickens. And the reason that I'm doing that is sharp tail are not prairie chickens, but those of people that know about them, they generally call them prairie chickens, we call them chickens. They're uh, closely related, but different species. There are um, all three, are, there's three, two sharp tail greater and lessers and sharp tail grouse. They're very closely related, they're North American species, so I figured, well, if people think they're prairie chickens, I'll show them what prairie chickens are. So I'm gonna talk about both species, uh, the range and subspecies. I have a short uh, video, kind of courtesy of the uh, Kansas uh, Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism. They've allowed me to use that, and so you can see the difference. I have my own video that I'm going to do. Uh, lek, uh, lek is the dancing ground that they got. That's what it, what it's called. So I will talk a little bit about the behavior on that because that's the, the really cool part I think about it, uh, about uh, the birds and what they do. And I'm going to go into breeding and nesting and then status and issues and then to the extent that I can, I will entertain questions. Now, these are the, the grouse and, and grouse-like birds. So um, the top one there, the rough grouse, is probably, you can see why it's called a rough grouse, because the rough, that's the one that most people are probably familiar and if you haven't seen them, you've heard them in the spring, and they're the ones that sit on a log and they bang their wings together and you hear And like all the birds, uh, the, the grouse-like birds, they're very good hiders. And I saw one last year, I was out and I actually saw it doing it. And then it froze and I had my field glasses and I was looking out trying to see it, and it took me about five, ten minutes to see the thing, even though I knew exactly where it was. The, the commas, camouflage is that good. Now, rough grouse are the ones that are generally in aspen or parkland uh, settings, so they have to have quite a few uh, aspen trees versus the spruce grouse and the blue grouse that you see there. 
Blue grouse are the ones that everybody calls fool hens, but all of these grouse will freeze and quite often let you get quite close, uh, amazingly so sometimes. None of them are very bright birds. Um, the other ones that you may have heard a bit about are sage grouse, and they're the ones that are not doing very well in Canada. There were probably, from what I can tell, about 3,000 birds, and it's the northern end of their range are around one four, so uh, uh, southeastern Alberta and into, into Saskatchewan, and there are maybe a couple of dozen birds left now, and they're bringing them up there. They, the government has been sued for not doing more to save them, so they're now trying to bring birds up from the states. However, to give you uh, some perspective about that, um, in uh, the states, I know a, a member of the Grouse Partnership uh, is on the board, and he said he's seen a flock of about 3,000 in the states, so they're doing very well there. In my mind, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to try and save a bird in Canada just because the board, bur, border is there. Do that now. The other thing about sharp t or sage grouse is they're specialists. They have to live on uh, sage. They cannot, unlike the other species, there live on grain. They can't pallet them. And about 85% of the bird species in on the prairies are in decline to serious decline because they are species like that that are specialists and if something happens with their environment or their habitat then they have problems and they are becoming concerned about them in the states as well although there's still hunting seasons for them but they're talking about closing that off. <laughs> then you can see prairie chickens and sharp-tailed grouse and you can see the difference there and I threw in ring that pheasant and partridge, a great partridge or huns, Hungarian partridges they were known and they're the ones that on the prairie. The two that I don't have there are uh, two species of ptarmigan and they're alpine birds that change color to white in the winter but we don't see them as much so I'm just focusing on those birds so I'll move on now and focus um, some interesting facts about sharp tail that I thought I'd throw in there. The natives call them the fire grouse or fire bird and they need fire or that's one of the things to clear the environment for them to come in. Now I'm not sure whether I would think if the natives call them that, that they must have had uh, and danced uh, on the fires after it's gone through. But here, I, I do know if you overgraze a dancing ground elect, the birds are gone. And one of the things I'll say about grouse is they need different habitats or different things for different types of the year. So that's uh, uh, hard to assess because you'll look out and you'll say, well, that looks like they, they need native prairie. That's a, that's a must. Um, and you look out and you say, well, there's native prairie here. The birds should be here. It's wide open because they need the open spaces. It, but if the proper uh, habitat isn't there for winter, for example, where they need a little bit more cover, or if there's something wrong and the birds can't nest there, then they won't be there. So um, now the other thing about grouse is what they've got, their, their um, niche, environmental niche, is that they're very fast flyers. I call them the antelope of the, the skies because like antelope, antelope run very fast for very long distances and grouse can do the same thing. They can easily go 10 kilometers, no problem at all, and they are very, very fast. And being a, a falconer and working with falconers, seeing them, it's really quite interesting to, to see um, how they outfly the birds quite often. And what you do with a falconer is you have, with long wings, you put a bird, a falcon in the air, and it's supposed to circle above you. And if you do that, and those of you who are hunters might um, be quite surprised, the game will sit. So if you've got ducks or Hungarian gray partridge or pheasant, things like that, they will sit. They will not move until you actually go up and flush them. But uh, when there's a falcon in the air, but sharp tail grouse will, because quite often the falcon is supposed to be circling over here and then it moves over there and it's looking the other way and they just get up because they know they can beat them. And the other thing is that when the falcons come down and they try and do it quite often, one of the techniques, they'll come in behind and come up and grab the birds like a duck or a Hungarian partridge. You try that with a sharp tail and they just turn on the afterburners and you're out of luck. 
And with sharp tail, you get one chance and that's it. Doesn't matter how high, the bird comes down and goes up and the sharp tail are gone. And they've got some also, I'll bet some of the gross um, biologists aren't aware of this or haven't seen this, but the other thing is how they handle when a falcon does chase them because they are, uh, aerial predators probably one of the main things that does get them. And if a falcon is coming down like this, the gross can execute a roll. And so they'll be over here. Of course, the falcon is going so fast it can't move over. And I had a friend of mine that said uh, last year, uh, it was saying that he sent his, took his bird up and he said, the bird came up like this and the sharp tail did a roll. And he said, and of course, that's it. That's your, your chance. You just missed it, you lost. And he said the next time the bird came in right in behind it and turned upside down to grab it from behind so it couldn't roll. And he said the ghost just did a little thing with its wings and popped up about this far. And there was the grouse empty, or the falcon empty handed again. So they're, they're very good at that. And as they say, they only get one chance. There's a very high mortality rate. Uh, as you see there, the chicks, half of them die in the first 30 days. The other interesting thing, and some of the other species of grouse, like the rough grouse, will do, um, especially if it's really cold, they'll dive into the snow. And they dive into the snow and they'll make a, a burrow about a, a meter or so. And it's a really good, if it's 35 or 40 below and you go into snow, snow never gets any colder than zero. So you've already warmed yourself up, you're out of the wind and you're out of sight of predators. It's a very effective way. And I do know people who go out snowshooting or cross-country skiing in Saskatchewan, and they said, oh, yeah, you go out early in the morning, and these grouse are popping up out of the snow. <laughs> you're skiing. Mm -hmm. So that's just uh, some interesting things to tell about the sharp tail in particular. Now, sharp tail versus prairie chickens, as you can quite clearly see there, there is a difference between them. And the obvious difference is the sharp tail have the, the sharp tail, the two middle uh, feathers in their tail are taller, but they're, um, so the tails are different, but the obvious thing and the, the coloration, the prairie chickens are darker, but the prairie chickens have these two feathers on the neck and they can raise them and lower them. And they have this big pouch and they boom from that pouch. So ch prairie chickens are, are called uh, boomers. Now, why do people call sharp-tailed grouse or why is it prairie chickens or, or everything seems to focus on prairie chickens? Prairie chickens are not in Canada anymore. They've been extirpated from Canada. And uh, you read the literature about them. They thought that when the buffalo went and when the settlers started coming in, it changed the whole environment. And people don't realize uh, about buffalo. When the buffalo came in, they fouled and wrecked everything. They were like a fire. And you, you hear about uh, some of the, uh, the, the uh, traders and the uh, scouts, and the scouts would say to the Mounties, uh, Jerry Potts, we can't go this way because the buffalo have been there, so we can't go. So it would have devastated that. So that would have made it easier, and particularly prairie chickens like tall grass prairie, so they need that. But they thought, and with they can both take grain, so both populations, but particularly prairie chickens, exploded in number. And they thought, well, they must have come north with the increase in population um, at that time and come into Canada, and they probably were migratory. But and then, and they thought that till recently, and they just got fossilized evidence that say that the prairie chickens go back 9,000 years. And I was just reading about Peter Erasmus, who is, uh, is a fascinating guy, probably most people don't know him. He was uh, a Métis from uh, Fort Garry, Winnipeg area, that uh, came out. Uh, amazing guy. He spoke six native languages, plus English, Latin, and Greek. He was probably the most educated man on the prairies. but. And he also saved Treaty Number no. Six, but he talks about prairie chickens, and I'm going to assume he knows, and I'm going to assume he was there, came out in the 50s. Well, he was on the prairies. He was born and raised on the prairies, and he talks about prairie chickens migrating, but not south, as the implication was. They migrated north into the bogs because he was from around the Edmonton area, and uh, ate cranberries. So he mentions that there. So I found that quite interesting. But sharp tail, as you can see, are not prairie chickens, but they are closely related. Both of them have dancing grounds. Both of them 
stomp their feet and have vocalizations. Uh, prairie chickens, they, they once numbered in the millions, and as you show when I get to the uh, range area, they have their, their range is greatly decreased. So, so again, you can see the difference there. Um, I mentioned they're extirpated from the Canadian range. Uh, there was estimated over a million birds in Canada at one time, and they're all gone. And so, why, and I think the reason that people call and relate to prairie chickens is I think prairie chickens were probably by far the most numerous birds on the prairie. And that's just a carryover from the old days. And you see some of the things where the original settlers that came in, they used to have wagon loads of them, you know, kill them. They were just all over. But now they're gone from Canada. Um, why do they survive? Well, obviously their environment isn't suitable for them. Or they couldn't survive in here versus sharp tail could. And sharp tail do use a wider variety. They're more tolerant of trees, which uh, prairie chickens aren't. But both species are windmills, uh, wind turbines are a big issue with them, cultivated land, uh, that sort of thing, and certainly uh, overgrazing and, and uh, agricultural use. And they both need native prairie. And native prairie is one of the <coughs> rarest uh, ecosystems on the planet because it is so good for agriculture. And even if you look, uh, Around here, for example, and you say, well, we've got lots of it. You know, you look around and you can see it. Most of it is not pristine. Most of it is full of invasive species and things like that, even if it hasn't been cultivated. And the other thing that people don't realize is when you take native prairie and cultivate it from a wildlife perspective, it's like sterilizing the land. You're taking most of the wildlife out of it. But anyway, um, can't remember what the next slide is. Okay, yes, I'm going, prairie chickens are known for, called boomers because of that big orange sack that they've got. And they, as you see in the video, which is coming up, there are greater and lesser are considered two separate species of uh, grouse. And they, with the sharp tail, are the three. The other ones is uh, the atwaters, and they are the rarest bird that we've got in North America right now. They are along the Gulf Coast, um, on the prairie areas in there, and they almost lost them. They got down to about 150 birds, and then they had a hurricane came through, and they ended up with about 60 birds, I think. And so they're very, very heavily managed. Virtually uh, all the birds have are, are tagged. They have bands and markers on them. Uh, the females, the wild females, have transmitters on, so they try and go out before the predators get and ruin the nest because predation of nests uh, is a very big problem or a, a standard thing for these <coughs> birds. So when they found, find a nest, they go out and actually peg wire around so that the ground predators at least can't get in to get at them. And they're trying very hard to keep them going. And the other one is a heath hen, and that is, uh, in the New England area, that's extinct. And that's uh, quite an interesting one. Um, both the Atwaters and the Heath Hen were also, numbers were considered at about a million apiece. And the Heath Hen was last in Martha's Vineyard. And they were so numerous there that they think the pilgrims, when they had the first Thanksgiving, it was probably a Heath Hen and not turkeys that they were eating. And the other thing is that Heath Hen were so commonly used in food that they said that uh, servants, when they uh, signed their contracts, they would stipulate or try and stipulate that they wouldn't be fed heath hen more than twice a week. <laughs> and their heath hen, or the heath hen was also the first bird that they ever tried to save. But they didn't bring them into captivity. They had them on Martha's Vineyard, which is an island. And they got down to about 150 birds. They got them up to about 2,000, but they had everything there in one place. And they had four things that hit them at once. They had a fire go through so that the spirit uh, destroyed the environment. They had an exceptionally harsh winter, so that's a one-two punch. They had goshawks move into the area and, and prey on them, and then they had domestic chicken diseases come in, and they just couldn't handle all four of that. I think in 27, uh, 1927, uh, there was 
11 birds and by 33 the last one died out. And they don't even have enough of them to know, to be able to check from a DNA perspective if they were in fact distinct species. But I thought that would be kind of interesting. Now prairie chicken range here, you can see from the different colors there what the range was and it's very typical for a lot of species. This is what happens, it shrinks, it gets smaller and smaller and then you get uh, isolation in them. And you can see that, so the heath hens are the ones on the New England there, they're gone. The two little ones at the bottom on the Gulf Coast, that's where the uh, atwaters are and they're trying very hard to save them as I said. And the other area are the greater prairie chickens. The lesser prairie chickens are in that area, but they're also in the uh, top end of uh, uh, Texas and then into uh, New Mexico. I think, is that New Mexico there? Yeah, I think it is. My geography isn't that good, so right beside Texas to the west of Texas. And then they're up into that purple area a little bit, so they're up into Kansas and Nebraska, uh, Nebraska but their numbers are much smaller. And they're, uh, the, this is actually a, uh, it's not a greater prairie chicken, it's a lesser prairie chicken, because note the brown pouch, and it's more red, other than the oblong orange one for the graders. So, and it's a darker bird, so. That's uh, the thing about them. Uh, we're gonna run a prairie chicken video here so that you get to see what they look like. <clears throat> and we'll see, we just have to get that set up. It's uh, about three minutes long, so I wanted to get you to be able to- Prairie chickens are a special symbol of Kansas. Though they're found elsewhere, our state is the greatest stronghold of these handsome game birds. They have largely disappeared from their former American range with the loss of grassland and prairie habitat. And birders travel across America to see Kansas prairie chickens on their spring booming grounds. Kansas is home to both prairie chicken species. The graders, characterized by orange vocal sacs and their beautiful haunting booms, and lessers, a southwestern species with red vocal sacs and bubbling gobbles. Graders are common in the tall grass prairie of the Flint Hills in east central Kansas and the Smoky Hills in north central Kansas. Lessers inhabit the mid and short grass prairies of southwestern Kansas. Both species need large expanses of open grassland habitat to thrive. At the last rough count, about 100,000 prairie chickens represented the Kansas spring breeding population. Of that, lessers made up about 25%. Prairie chicken courtship on Lex is one of nature's finest shows. The first males arrive at the crack of dawn, immediately defending the perimeters of a small dancing area they've established since the previous fall. A large greater chicken lek may hold more than 40 breeding birds, but booming grounds of lesser chickens are usually much smaller, holding on average a dozen birds or so. Male chickens dance in a peculiar ritual, stomping their feet and advancing as they boom. These sounds can be heard for a mile or more on calm mornings. Flutter jumping is an odd courtship behavior where males jump high in the air, flapping their wings. This is repeated again and again in each male's own small arena, and it's an eye-catching attractor. The combination of sight and sound makes a prairie chicken lek easy for hens to find. Constant squabbling occurs as adjacent males defend their unseen borders. Usually these are beak-to-beak -beak disagreements that end with a tense truce, but not uncommonly fighting occurs. Battles usually momentary, but sometimes serious and lasting for 10 minutes or more involve beaks and claws. An attacker may grab a beak full of his opponent's feathers, ripping them out. The lek is often littered with evidence of this fighting. Hens arrive by flying into the lek perimeter and then walking into its center. As they go, each male dances this way and that to show the hen every angle of its display. At its peak, the cock may drop, spread its wings, and stretch its head on the ground. 
The hen may feed, mostly ignoring her suitors, or may simply watch. When she chooses to mate, she squats, spreads her wings, and mating quickly occurs. Then she leaves the leg to her nest to lay an egg. Prairie chickens lay about a dozen eggs with average incubation dates starting in early May. Renesting is common when necessary through late May and even June, so the lek remains active for several months in spring. Prairie Chickens, a treasure of the Kansas outdoors. I'm Mike Blair for Kansas Wildlife and Parks. Well, thank you very much to uh, Kansas uh, for allowing me to use that. Uh, very nice of them to do that. So now we're going to talk about sharp-tailed grouse and compare them. There are seven subspecies and like the prairie chickens, one of them is extinct. Um, the Alaska ones are the far north ones. And actually maybe I'll get to it. probably easier to show on the next uh, thing. So this is the range of the, the sharp-tailed grouse. So you can see they're doing a lot better than prairie chickens, but they are still um, receding in some areas, but as you see on the Wisconsin, where Wisconsin between the two Great Lakes there, they've actually expanded a little bit in the Michigan as well. And that's because of clearing, because of agriculture, and Wisconsin is actually uh, actively uh, clearing land to make room for more sharp tail in there. But there are, and of course in the northern range they're doing quite well. So they're up in Alaska, the northern ones are up along uh, the uh, Northwest Territories, or the Northwestern ones rather. The Northern ones go across Northern Alberta, Saskatchewan and into Quebec. And then you have the two prairie species, the Plains, which is what we have, and then the prairie ones, which are further south, but their ranges do interlap a little bit. And then on the uh, Western slope of the Rockies, you have the Columbian ones there, and they've been uh, reduced quite substantially. The Colombian ones are smaller, I know, and they seem to be more tolerant of trees and tree cover. And actually, this is my only picture in the, in the whole thing other than the video, and that's uh, the lack that you're about to see. So for habitat and, and distribution in Alberta, anywhere that's suitable, they tend to be more common in the east and the west. There is some concern about them. Uh, in the west, all this, this area, which is uh, south of Nanton and in that area, uh, they appear to be quite doing quite well. I have five leks in the area that I discovered because once you discover one, it's not so hard to, to find another. And they are very noisy, as you heard from the prairie chicken video. Uh, you can hear them sometimes up to a mile away. And in fact, you nearly always hear them before you see them. They do need the open spaces and they do need uh, native grassland. And if there's too much cultivation, they won't be there. Uh, they do need some uh, cover, so uh, at least some bushes or some trees, for particularly in the winter time. So that requires different uh, cover. But you know, they can uh, fly long distances if they need to. And like a lot of birds, they flock together in the winter. And I mentioned about them uh, using the snow to roost. And they eat uh, buds and seeds, mainly flowers, but particularly the young will eat uh, insects. And that's not uncommon with uh, seed-eating birds. They need the protein, so they will go for the seeds and, and eat that. And I think this picture here is, is I, I put it in deliberately to try and show um, you know, how wide open and, uh, the different country. And the top part of it there, that hill there, is actually, that's where the nearest lek is, the next lek that, that I found. So that gives you an idea. And actually there's a, what would be probably three, four kilometers, I would think at least in between them. Now we're gonna go into my sharp tail video and I will say, uh, maybe not the best quality in here, but the idea was to show uh, what it looks like. Uh, how are we doing here? Well, we'll see how we're doing. I'll let Wendy uh, uh, fight with that. Yeah. A lot of work. Uh, this is uh, what I put together, and I, I actually uh, did one version of it. And then when I found out that Wendy was uh, wanted me to talk, I actually had to go. I did my homework, and then I ended up 
changing it and changing some of the speech things. So it's about 13 minutes long. Gross in display on their dancing grounds, or lek, from the Swedish at lekka, which means to play. Generally, you hear the birds before you see them, and this is what they saw. Sharp tailed grouse are often called chickens or prairie chickens. In fact, prairie chickens are a different but very closely related species, but are no longer found in Canada as they were all shot out during the 30s. Both, however, have dancing grounds and both display very similar. Prairie chickens are known for their tall neck feathers that come up over their head, but both also stomp their feet. And in the case of sharp-tailed grouse, that's 20 times a second. And that is a that you hear. This is when the birds are most active, and that's the uh, first thing in the morning, in this case uh, before sunup. The females are also on the lek. This is uh, the end of April, generally uh, middle of April uh, into May that the females come on the lek, and of course that really gets the males going. The females are the ones that are just standing, kind of walking around, checking out the males and they're deciding which ones to mate with. This is a slightly larger lek than normal with about uh, 30 birds or 30 males, which is how you count them. Most of them are kind of uh, 10 to 20 in this area, but I've seen this lek up to twice as many, so they're doing very well here. The males do most of the vocalization, obviously, to attract the females. Here, there's a, you can see a gobble. And there's also a boom, which they uh, obviously use the purple air sacs on their neck and put out through their nose and mouth. The interesting thing about the boom is that you almost never hear it when the females are on the lek, and I gather it's probably too hard to do. What they do do, however, is the number of peeps and cheeps. And the other thing that they will hear, and generally it's after two males have had a pretty good fight, or generally when they're facing each other, is a kind of uh, what I call a whale, for lack of anything else. The feet stomping is also very important. They do it 20 times a second, which uh, creates the noise that you hear. And they can even do it, as you can see here, in snow. fighting, which is quite common when you're looking out over a lek, you often see this. It's for dominance and for territory, and the birds, as you can see, really go at it. Quite often will pull feathers and draw blood. Thank <laughs> you. 
This shows how important territory is. This is one bird here that appears to either want to gain territory or has just recently lost it and is trying to get it back. But he comes in there in the territory of other birds and keeps it booted out from one territory to another and then sort of out of that area, but he keeps coming right back in again. Try to give him A for persistence. When the birds start up early in the season, um, which is about mid-March and into April, it takes them a while to get going. So there are often relatively long periods of quiet, which is what you see here now. Not even much in terms of vocalization, and they just take a while to get wound up and get going. And the other thing to note is the way the birds sit there, particularly when they're in pairs like that, I think uh, with their colorization, they look like rocks. And this is a form of uh, camouflage to help them up against predators. Now with all the noise and activity, of course, predators are aware that the birds are there and they will come in and take them, or at least try and take them. Here you've got an aerial predator, which is a harrier, and note that all the birds take off. In this case, the harrier came in, uh, it did see a dead grouse, but did come in four or five times to try and get a live one, to kind of get fresh food, if you will. Couldn't do that, so settled for the dead grouse. I've also got a red tail coming in. That this is a coyote coming in on the lek. This is a ground-based predator. And note the difference in behavior of the birds. They don't all get up and leave. They do keep an eye on it, but they give it a couple of meters or so because they know they can easily get up and leave and it'll never get them. And it comes and plays nonchalant. This is a pair of shoveler ducks that are looking for a place to nest and are considering use the lek with all the noise and activity as a cover. These are females that are checking out the lek, and this is the vocalization that both males and females will use when they fly. The females are just checking out the lek before they'll actually go on to it. They go from lek to lek in the area to check out the various males before they decide which one to mate with. And they generally come on to the lek uh, somewhere in the beginning, mid-April, and into May. Uh, when they decide to select a male, and as soon as they've done that and made it with them, then they go off to nest. Grouse aren't very smart, and they're not long-lived. I once found a lek by, uh, there was a whole bunch of females on the road, and I almost drove over them, and so I thought, well, there's got to be a lek around here, and there was. The males, as stated, start about uh, mid-March or so and go into certainly in the end of May, June, sometimes into July, and they'll do corresponding time in the fall, although not as intense because the females don't uh, tend to come in. They start uh, certainly uh, first thing, first light in the morning and go to 8 or 10. Sometimes they'll leave in twos and threes or as a group. And, but they'll go at any time. I've seen them June 8th at noon, and I've seen them uh, in the evening just before sundown. In fact, I once went to camp on a lek, and there the birds were, and they roosted on the lek. Sometimes you'll see a group of males that are courting a specific female pause when she pauses. And they won't move until she moves. And I think the reason for this is sometimes you also see males that will push a female too hard and she'll either run away or fly away. And this is their way of kind of backing you off a little bit and giving her space because they really are trying very hard to get her attention so that she will allow them to mate with her.
writing and using the whale that I mentioned earlier in the video. Hey, that's the whale. You know, I seem to do that when you're facing me. are going hard at it they go for about 30 to 50 seconds and then pause and I think there's two reasons for this one is to keep an eye out for predators and the other is just to catch their breath because they really are going at it hard It's amazing the amount of time and effort the male spent on the lek basically getting ready for mating. And the actual mating itself takes place, as you can see here, very quickly, just a few seconds. It's the dominant males who end up doing the mating, those in the center of the lek. And in this case, this male spent an awful lot of time courting this female. He probably spent 20 minutes, half an hour at least, very patient going around. She was obviously interested, but every time he went to approach her, she would turn and face him. When the female's ready, she kind of droops her wings and squats a little bit, and the male has to mount her and finish very quickly because, as you see here, he's liable to get knocked off by a rival male. Once the females have mated, they go off to nest, usually within a mile of the lek. Well, anyway, there, there's my video. I, uh, the idea, as I say, I wanted to show you what it looks, what the birds are doing, because you really have to see it, and that's why I created the video. It may not be the best quality, but I think it's good enough to see what the birds do and how they behave. And this is a schematic drawing of a of a lek to give you an idea how it works. Um, in the case of the one that I have, I think some of the territories are a bit more elongated, but uh, it does do that. The other thing that you'll see quite often when you've got a quite a large lek is you'll have a group of birds in one area, and then off there'll be a couple more that are sort of detached from it. And you wonder, what are those goofy birds doing in part of it? But one of the things that they've also found that, uh, particularly with prairie chickens and uh, isolated populations or very small populations, as I mentioned, it's only the dominant males that do the mating, and that concentrates. So if you've got, uh, I think, uh, uh, Missouri, for example, has about 600 birds, you've got a concentrated population that's actually genetically even more concentrated and inbred because there's only a few males that are doing all the mating. And as I stated, uh, generally you can have them first at, at first light, uh, I mentioned about camping on the lek one time and it was really nice because I was sleeping and then they, they woke me up and I got up, packed up my bedroll and had a chair and I had coffee and muffins and I sat and watched them. And the other thing is they come back to the same lek year after year and they've even been known to dance on houses that have been built on the leks and I have seen them go onto a vehicle that was driven onto the lek 
going on to that. But they also move too. And I'm told in the Grasslands National Park, for example, they move to the parking lot because they like it. So if you want a guaranteed spot where you're going to see sharp tail, there's one right there. Um, but as I say, they go at any time of the day. I saw, as he said in the video, uh, at noon, and I've seen them uh, last thing in the evening before sundown. Uh, they do go, they have a similar uh, period in the fall that they go, and people have told me, well, it's a similar photo period, but it doesn't make sense if you think about it, because if they're going into June, that's very close to the equinox, which is June 21st or 22nd, and I've read in the, the writings that I read that they're going to July sometimes, so if that's the case, they should go right through. Uh, but generally into September and uh, October is the time in the fall. It's not nearly as uh, intense. It's uh, more to establish dominance and for practice for the young birds of the season to go through and do that. Um, they lay uh, similar to very similar, as they say, closely related to prairie chickens. So. As in the Kansas video, the, uh, about a dozen eggs uh, for about 24 days. And they're called precochial, if I'm pronouncing it right. And what that means is, I, I loved it, I, I looked it up on uh, um, Wiki, and uh, it said uh, uh, precochial, a, a name that biologists use so they don't have to use a whole bunch of other words to say what they want. Gee, I know dozens of words like that. The dictionary is full of them. Uh, anyway, somebody a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Tongue but what that means is that the young are born fairly independent, so they have feathers, they can walk around, they can feed themselves, they can self-regulate their heat. And uh, that means uh, two things. Um, one, that the females have to put more into the eggs in order for them to develop that far. And they also don't have as far to develop to adulthood. And that's one of the reasons why I think that they're not very bright. And also, males don't have to look after them. And the, the other thing is, uh, for security, they're only really vulnerable when they're all on the nest. After that, when the young are out, if you get predators come in, that may get some of them, but not likely to get all of them. Uh, versus um, altricle, if I'm pronouncing that right, which means you know things that you see in a nest, like robins, for example, they're born naked but often their eyes aren't open yet, they can't self-regulate, so the adults, both adults have to look after them and do that, and the, the risk is that if a predator finds your nest with them in, then you've lost the whole works. Uh, but they have, they can develop, um, they've got further that they can develop, and they tend to, don't quote me on this, but my impression is that they can be smarter, so a lot of, uh, seed eaters, things like chickadees and things like that, that uh, hide seeds are that way because they need to be smarter. And actually, chickadees, things like that, in this time of year, have a better memory and can remember a bit more than we can. They're that good. They also um, fly, uh, like most of our grouse here, very early, one to two weeks. It's about two weeks for sage grouse, for example. And that just makes them more mobile again and more likely to survive. And I suspect also because they grew up on the prairies with buffalo and wildfires, so that makes them more mobile. And dispersal is eight to 10 weeks. Um, so the status and issues, uh, status of sharp tail are considered sensitive uh, versus say uh, rough grouse and spruce and uh, uh, blue grouse, which are considered secure. And of course, uh, in Canada, at least, sage grouse are considered highly endangered because they're worried about losing them. However, populations are declining. They're particularly concerned about populations in uh, western Alberta, although these, and I have five lucks in the area, it's in the Porcupine Hills, and they appear to be doing quite well there. And there are large lecks, that lek that you saw there, I've seen them about 60 birds or so, and I've heard another one that's close to uh, 100 birds north of there. So, And I think I mentioned about uh, agricultural activity, and just generally, um, it's kind of death by a thousand cuts. We have more acreages around now. Uh, we have windmills, we have more power lines, and just more of everything and more people. And to give you an idea, in Nose Hill Park, up until 2000, they had sharp tail there, 
and they're gone, and I think the area can easily support them. There's just too many people. Can't handle that. So thank you all. That's my presentation. I'll entertain any questions uh, that you might have, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them if I can. And for you, John, I think this is a great presentation, spectacular. And so that's it from us here in uh, Okotoks. <laughs>